the island of Cuba becomes the center of the world. Fidel Castro says the Russian missiles are for defense, but for others, they are a deadly threat. For 15 days in October 1962, the world is on edge. Will it be a countdown to World War III? It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. On the evening of October the 22nd, 1962, American President John F. Kennedy announced the Soviet Union was building missile bases on Cuba, just 90 miles from mainland America. Never before have so many waited so anxiously for the words of an American president. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, Unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will be found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. Adding to the tension is the revolution in Cuba. Castro's takeover means that a regime sympathetic to Russia now stands at America's doorstep. I think the Cuban Revolution was the first genuine communist revolution that didn't come from Stalin's tanks doing a takeover. So the old commies in Moscow looked at the young commies in Cuba and said, yeah, right, the new generation, this is great. Throughout 1962, the Soviet Union secretly smuggled 42 mid-range nuclear missiles into Castro's Cuba using commercial shipping. But with no proof, the Americans can only air their suspicions at a UN meeting. Do you, Ambassador Zoran, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? You will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. If you have your missiles in Turkey, we have our missiles in Cuba. And that was the game. The Cuban missiles mean the Soviets can now annihilate Los Angeles, Washington, and New York within just 30 minutes. And Russia does not intend to stop there. Khrushchev promised Castro the Soviet Union would actively support this first communist foothold in the Western Hemisphere. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And I will faithfully execute the office. January 20th, 1961, Kennedy took office with a strong warning to Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. America would not tolerate the spread of communism, especially in America's backyard. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house.
Cuba, only 90 miles from Florida, had once been a favorite vacation spot for Americans. Now, it seemed an armed enemy camp. Less than three months after taking office, Kennedy approved a secret CIA plan, begun under President Eisenhower, to overthrow Castro's revolution. April 17, 1961. 1,400 Cuban exiles, secretly trained and equipped by the CIA, landed at the Bay of Pigs on Cuba's southern coast. The CIA expected the invasion to trigger a popular uprising inside Cuba, but they underestimated Castro's strength. There was no uprising, and the invasion was a miserable failure. There's an old saying that uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. I think it was the first thing he ever really lost, and he felt pretty bad. He felt like he wasn't sure that Alan Dulles of the CIA and the Joint Chiefs thought the plan was as good as they uh, told him it was. And he also thought that maybe they believed that a, a man that had been president less than three months could start off with a failure. Premier Khrushchev arrives in Vienna for the first summit meeting with a U.S. president since the ill-starred conference with President Eisenhower in Paris. Two months later, still smarting from his defeat at the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy flew to Vienna for what turned out to be a tense and hostile summit meeting with Nikita Khrushchev. For Khrushchev, the summit was his first opportunity to test the resolve of the young president. Despite the pleasantries, the meeting went poorly. Khrushchev threatened to sever Western access to Berlin, the symbol of divided post-war Europe. Kennedy refused to give ground. Threats of war were exchanged. Within a few months, the threats made in Vienna took form in Berlin. Khrushchev built a wall dividing the city into Eastern and Western sectors. American and Soviet tanks faced each other in the streets. We came very close to World War III. Our tanks, combat ready, were in Berlin, only 200 meters from the American tanks. And as a participant in those events, let me assure you that if the Americans had followed the orders they were given, and as I understand it, the United States troops were ordered to destroy the Berlin Wall, our tanks would have opened fire. Berlin itself did not erupt into war, but the crisis served once again to thrust nuclear weapons into the forefront of superpower relations. The president and the free world uh, are willing to use nuclear weapons to uh, preserve our position in uh, Berlin to ensure that the people of Berlin remain free and that we have access to that city. Nuclear weapons had become the central tool of superpower diplomacy. During that 10th September of 1961, the Soviets tested the largest hydrogen bomb the world had ever seen. But it was not proof of military superiority. In fact, they had only about six intercontinental missiles capable of striking the American mainland. The United States had hundreds of nuclear weapons capable of striking the Soviet Union from North America. And the United States also enjoyed a geographical advantage with weapons based in allied countries much closer to the Soviet Union. Great Britain, Italy, and Turkey. Khrushchev was acutely aware of the U.S. nuclear advantages. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. All U.S. armed forces go to defense condition DEFCON 3. It's just two levels away from war, but still no more than a threatening gesture. shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States 
requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. Retaliation would come in the form of B-52s, the core of the American nuclear bomber fleet. There are more than 500 available, 66 of which are constantly in the air, directly threatening the Soviet Union. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Thank you and good night. Did the president strike the right note with this mixture of strength and caution? He wants to keep options open, avoiding talk of an invasion. In 40 years of Cold War, the world never came closer to nuclear holocaust than in the week that followed. In the West, many people still remember the tension they felt then. But what's less well known is how people felt in the East, living in a closed society the media tightly controlled by the Soviet system. Did ordinary Soviet citizens know how close the world was to war? October 1961 and another turn of the screw at the Communist Party Congress in Moscow. Khrushchev was accused by China of being soft in his dealings with the West. His leadership of the communist world seemed threatened. With his plans for Berlin frustrated, Khrushchev looked for a way to strengthen the Soviet position in the Cold War battleground. He found an answer in Cuba. Khrushchev explained in his tape-recorded memoirs. While I was on an official visit to Bulgaria, one thought kept hammering away at my brain. What will happen if we lose Cuba? We had to think of some way of confronting America with more than words. The logical answer was missiles. The United States had already surrounded the Soviet Union with its own bomber bases and missiles. We'd be doing nothing more than giving them a little of their own medicine. The Soviet Union had been shipping oil, agricultural equipment, and technicians to Castro's Cuba for several years. But in late summer of 1962, Soviet troops and military equipment arrived on the island at an increasing rate. Alexander Alexeyev was Soviet ambassador to Cuba. It was clear that the United States was preparing to invade Cuba. So we sent in more military supplies, planes, MiGs, Soviet military advisors. And finally, we and the Cubans decided that in order to avoid a United States invasion, we should supply Cuba with missiles. There was a risk in this, of course, that was taken by our government and especially by Christian. At that time, I was 32 years old. I was a scientist, a researcher in the Academy of Sciences. My wife was a journalist. We had been married just three years. We had a little girl, Katya, and we felt all life was in front of us. We were full of plans. The Gorbovskis lived in a single room in a tenement block on the outskirts of Moscow. They shared communal kitchens with other families in the block. Luxuries were few. But life behind the Iron Curtain wasn't all doom and gloom, as was imagined by many in the West. Rather, Alexander remembers the good things, the benefits of living in a communist state. 
we had free medicine, we had free studies, and everything what we had, we believed, was given to us by the Soviet system. We were taught, when your time comes, you will be given a flat. There is a queue, but when your time comes, you will have it free. And it was true. Maybe it was because I was young then. I don't know, but I remember them as sunny days, sunny years. In Soviet Russia, the first news of the Cuban crisis appeared in Pravda, the official newspaper of the Communist Party, on October the 24th, two days after Kennedy's speech to the West. The article described how Kennedy had ordered a blockade of Cuba, 180 US Navy vessels surrounding the island. It described the plucky Cuban people watching the skies, digging in against American attack. With no mention of Soviet missiles spotted on the island, the article seemed confusing. But I don't understand why. It just says President Kennedy tries to justify his aggressive action by talking of an alleged threat to American national security from Cuba. Cuba's so tiny. It's a fly on America's nose. What threat can he mean? It doesn't say. Um, Peace-loving states cannot fail to protest against Kennedy, this pirate who thinks international law does not apply to the USA, blah, blah. But people of all countries should understand, behaving so irresponsibly, the USA takes a step along the route to unleashing a world thermonuclear war. It's just the usual. This time it sounds more serious. It wasn't unusual to be confused reading Pravda. Everyone knew the state press was heavily censored. Only news that reflected well on the Soviet system was included. And because that was the way it had always been, no one really questioned it. As Alexander explains, the art with Pravda was to read between the lines. It was normal. You looked for clues in what was said and what was left unsaid. You asked yourself, is the language stronger than usual? In this case, yes, it was stronger. It was obvious to us straight away. Something was happening, and it had to do with Cuba and American aggression against Cuba. If Pravda was right, if America was threatening Cuba, it begged the question, why? For most Soviets, it wasn't such a hard question to answer. Cuba was an island of special significance to the Soviet people. Four years earlier, in January 59, Fidel Castro had swept into Havana, Cuba's capital, the leader of the first communist revolution in the Western Hemisphere. These were electrifying scenes for most ordinary Soviets. Newsreels of Castro's struggle echoed images of Russia's own Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. But if Castro was a hero to the Soviets, to the Americans he was quite the opposite. Says Castro, the Cuban revolutionary government has no reason to offer explanations to America or to anyone except the people of Cuba. In 1961, Kennedy had allowed the CIA to organize a ragtag army of Cuban right-wingers in an attempt to overthrow Castro. It was an embarrassing failure. 
Soviet propaganda showed capitalist America huffing and puffing with anger, desperate to remove this pocket of communism in their own backyard. If Pravda now spoke of further American aggression against Cuba, it seemed to make perfect sense. Kennedy and his advisors were convinced that Khrushchev would not have nuclear missiles installed in Cuba. The Soviets had never placed missiles outside their own territory, not even in other Eastern Bloc countries. But in Washington, the political pressure mounted. Kennedy was concerned the issue might hurt the Democrats in the upcoming elections. He drew the line dramatically and forcefully. If at any time the communist buildup in Cuba were to endanger or interfere with our security in any way or become an offensive military base of significant capacity for the Soviet Union, then this country will do whatever must be done to protect its own security and that of its allies. Kennedy's commitment to act would soon be tested. On Sunday, October 14, 1962, a U-2 reconnaissance plane left Edwards Air Force Base, California, to take high-level photos over western Cuba. In a field near the village of San Cristobal, the photographs clearly showed 30-foot-long, medium-range Soviet nuclear missiles. Although the missiles were not yet ready to fire, CIA experts predicted they soon would be. The missiles could hit almost half the U.S. mainland, including New York and Washington. Early Tuesday morning, Kennedy was shown the photos by National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. Uh, I do recall that when I uh, talked to the president in the morning, we got to that question, what do we do? And uh, one or the other or both of us said, well, we'll probably have to take them out. That was our first reaction. Bundy was instructed by the president to assemble a select group of 13 cabinet members and top-level advisors to meet in secret session late that morning. The group became known as the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, the XCOM. One of the first questions addressed by the group was whether the missiles in Cuba endangered the massive American advantage in nuclear weapons. While the Joint Chiefs of Staff thought the missiles were a military threat, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara disagreed. The meetings were secretly tape recorded by Kennedy with a microphone under the table. What is the strategic impact on the position of the United States and MRBMs in Cuba? How greatly does this change the strategic balance? Well, I think the United States has been very The XCOM members knew that even without missiles in Cuba, the Soviets could already destroy major American cities with intercontinental missiles and missile-carrying submarines. Kennedy and McNamara felt that the missiles were as much a political problem as a military threat, an unacceptable provocation. At one point, Kennedy regretted having committed himself to act if the Soviets installed offensive weapons in Cuba. The transcript of the meeting continues. President Kennedy, last month I should have said that we don't care. What difference does it make? They've got enough to blow us up now anyway. After all, this is a political struggle as much as military. Defense Secretary McNamara added, I don't believe it's primarily a military problem. It's primarily a domestic political problem. I didn't believe that the introduction of the weapons shown here or shown on the other uh, photographs would change the military balance between East and West. But I did believe then, and I do believe now, that it was a politically unacceptable move. We could not allow this hemisphere to become a base for offensive uh, Soviet forces. It was the political consequences that were the most urgent thing. That is, if the Soviets could change or alter the balance by the rapid secret deployment of nuclear weapons this is just not acceptable in the nuclear age the political consequences would have been enormous the effects on berlin on western europe on all of our allies so it was the political consequences that i think concerned us most of all 
The decision made to get the missiles out of Cuba, the XCOM then faced the question, what action can the U.S. take? The first option considered was an all-out invasion of Cuba. Remembering the Bay of Pigs disaster, Robert Kennedy agreed that limited military action would be a serious mistake. Robert Kennedy then suggested the U.S. create a pretext for an invasion by staging an action against the U.S. base in Cuba at Guantanamo Bay or by sinking a U.S. ship, as was done in 1898 when the U.S. entered the Spanish-American War. I think Bobby Kennedy, in my presence, kept reflecting the, the view that this was the watershed crisis uh, of the Kennedy administration, a time of truth, chance to redeem himself from clear, clearly what had been mistakes in the Bay of Pigs, but that it was essential that he do so in a way that would leave his brother to go down in history as a hero and a moral leader for the United States. They were our brothers. And so we thought after that fiasco the year before, the Americans are just trying to find a new reason for occupation, invasion, whatever. But this picture of Cuba and the Soviet Union standing side by side against American aggression tells only half the story. What then was the story from America's point of view? Over three years, they'd watched the friendship between Cuba and the Soviet Union. How trade deals had led to arms deals. If Khrushchev supplied Castro with defensive weapons, guns, tanks, that was none of America's business. But what if, in return, Castro let Khrushchev use Cuba as a strategic base for offensive weapons to attack the USA. The CIA was ordered to keep an eye on the island. And on October the 14th, 1962, spy planes confirmed America's fears. The photographs showed missile transporters, fuel trucks, radar vans, nuclear warhead bunkers under construction. And intelligence reports informed Kennedy that at that very moment, more nuclear hardware was on its way. For five days, Kennedy had held talks with his National Security Council, reviewing the options, planning a response. The blockade was launched to intercept the arrival of any more missiles and to force Khrushchev to a public resolution of the crisis. These were the facts Pravda had hoped to hide from the Soviet people. But for some Russians, Alexander and Aksana included, there were other ways to find out the truth. We used to listen to Western radio. It was not usual, but it was not forbidden. I had learned English at school. It was part of my work. And so, unlike most people, we could listen to the voice of America. It was a window into the outside world. This sudden, clandestine decision the station's strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil, in violation of Soviet assurances, is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo, which cannot be accepted by this country. And what we heard, of course, was quite different to what we had read already in the Russian press. The Gorbovskis listened as the Americans took their case to the world. 
Do you, Ambassador Zoran, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? <laughs> you will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. Well, there was a contradiction. All the Russian newspapers and radio and TV and Khrushchev himself has stressed there are no missiles. And the West insists there are missiles. You see? So, who are we to believe? Our Khrushchev or these imperialists? It was not something we like to think that our leaders would lie to us. Best we thought to avoid the question, not to ask who is right, who is wrong. Who was right? Who was wrong? Clearly, Khrushchev had lied about the missiles on Cuba. But whether it was wrong to sight missiles on Cuba at all depends again on your point of view. After all, the Americans had missile bases in Turkey, just eight minutes firing time from Moscow. Five months earlier, Khrushchev had been walking on the Black Sea coast, across the water from Turkey. As his speechwriter later remembered, it was pointed out to him that American bases able to wipe out Kiev, Minsk, Moscow were located just on the opposite shore. Khrushchev turned and asked, so why cannot we have bases close to America? What is the reason for this uh, inequality? Although it's thousands of miles away, Germany is very close to the conflict. It always has the potential to be a future battleground for nuclear exchange between the two superpowers. The United States informs its German allies of the situation. Late night talks are held with German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. His opinion is clear. Do not back down on any account. Now is the time to drive a wedge between Castro and Khrushchev. One of Adenauer's ideas was that Castro's role should be played up because making Castro out to be the bad guy would give Khrushchev the opportunity to back down without losing face. I think that was Adenauer's basic concept. He was a sly fox, you know. Adenauer's advice was that Kennedy must follow through on what he has announced. Too much time has already gone by. Castro has been allowed to do as he pleases for too long. The same goes for Khrushchev, who divided Germany with a wall. The German leader believes the balance of power will be disturbed if Kennedy fails to act resolutely. The blockade allows the Kremlin to sound the all clear at least temporarily. Cuba is not going to be attacked for the time being. Naturally, there was a sense of relief when Kennedy announced the blockade. Because in the language of diplomacy, that means I am prepared to negotiate. Khrushchev wants to demonstrate that there is no need to panic. The public will not see an agitated Soviet leadership heading home. The conference room becomes their dormitory. In the adjoining room, where the only bed has been prepared, Khrushchev lies down knowing his plan hasn't succeeded. But he has no intention of backing down yet. The game of poker has just begun. But is the high-stakes game worth the risk? This is where the decisive showdown will take place. Kennedy's armada is moving into position. 
60 heavily armed ships form a ring of steel and cannons. Will it be impenetrable? We had heard the president say that we were going to uh, intercept shipping. So the very first question that the commanding officer of the VSOL directed at me was, uh, uh, Commodore, what do I do if uh, we intercept uh, a ship approaching Cuba? And uh, he refuses to stop when I ask him to stop. Standard procedure is a single shot across the bow. If this doesn't stop the ship, then guns are fired to disable it. And finally, the ship is boarded. But wouldn't the firing of guns mean war? It was a mistake, I think, not to have uh, considered before the imposition of the blockade what exactly were to be the rules of engagement for our ships. It's possible that there could have been a, a very serious international incident. A single ship, a single captain, a single pilot acting prematurely could trigger all-out war. All morning, papers carry just one headline, Cuba blockaded. Hundreds of millions read it, knowing this could be the beginning of nuclear war. There was great concern for the families in those days. Uh, I can recall when I got off alert that Tuesday following uh, uh, President Kennedy's address, uh, telling my wife to prepare a survival kit, blankets, medicines, uh, and all kinds of paraphernalia, put it in the automobile, be prepared uh, to move at a moment's notice, watch the news, stay abreast of what was going on, and, and to be ready to move in, in short notice. Move in short notice, but where to? Would any place be spared if nuclear weapons were deployed? Which corner of the earth will be left intact when the world fell victim to man's whims? When a single flash destroys a world that took millions of years to create. October 22nd, 1962. Kennedy increases America's defense readiness condition from four to DEFCON three for the first time in history. 22 interceptor aircraft are ordered to sea. We never underestimated the Russians. We always assumed that they were as strong as we were, and it was our job to outwit them, to out-train them. It would be like two prize fighters knowing that nominally they had the same capabilities to knock the other guy out. Below the waves, the crew of B-59 has been away from home for three and a half weeks. And they're feeling more and more isolated and cut off from Moscow. Radio operator Vadim Orlov would later describe the situation to Tom Blanton at the U.S. National Security Archives. They weren't getting communications from Moscow. They were listening to Miami radio stations. There have been other the Washington Post says this morning to provide that Russian military attaches and Soviet embassy are sent On Miami radio, the stories are about impending U.S. invasion of Cuba. On Miami radio, it's descriptions of the flotilla offshore. It's descriptions of total mobilization. NBC Radio News on the Hour, brought to you by Total. American radio even speculates that there might be enemy submarine activity in the area. We could not get any contact with Moscow, and we had no idea what was going on. Everything I knew and everything I did was by listening to Kennedy on the radio. Kennedy. Keep listening. While the lack of contact with Moscow is a problem, the men are facing a more serious risk. A previous disaster aboard another submarine has made the chances of discovery much greater.
A year before, a nuclear reactor on board the sub K-19, one of the first Russian nuclear subs, failed catastrophically. Eight men died from radiation poisoning as they tried to fix the problem. Vasily Arkhipov was aboard the K-19 and witnessed the disaster. He must have really felt it. He had seen what radiation had done to people. He had seen it with his own eyes when some of those people who'd been in the nuclear reactor were carried out. It was a tragedy, a real tragedy. This tragedy was the reason that we would say no to nuclear war. But Soviet vessels are sailing full steam ahead. And the Soviet ships were approaching that quarantine line with no indication that they were going to do anything other than continue towards Cuba. If they try to violate that quarantine line, are we going to be the first to use military force? About 20 Russian ships are still heading for Cuba. One loaded with nuclear warheads reaches its destination just minutes before the American blockade closes. What will happen to the others? We were sitting there looking at the television pictures. Our ships 10 miles away, then 5 miles away. It was like an American Western. Will there be a showdown? When will the first round be fired? U.S. destroyers are told to fire only on orders from the White House. But suddenly, most Soviet freighters, the ones loaded with weapons, turn around. The remaining vessels stay on course to Cuba. Is it a sign of confusion or cool calculation? It was our way of saying, we will not send our ships across the line you have established. And Kennedy got the message. He did not even try to stop the Soviet tanker, the Bucharest, or the East German passenger ship. The East German cruise ship, Volker Freundschaft, is touring the Caribbean. One of the passengers, Willy Schaefer, is filming on board. Inadvertently, the cruise ship becomes a blockade buster. Someone said we would come under fire. Some people were expecting that to happen, while others said, oh, it's not that serious. We've got the Russians behind us, and they'll make sure the Americans don't get too close. Everyone had a different opinion, and nobody really knew. The Volker Freundschaft enters Havana Harbor. A tourist home movie shows no signs of a crisis. The people on board have no idea that they too are part of a risky game with high stakes. It was like in a bazaar where someone tells you the price is $300 and you offer $3. And then you have to settle somewhere in between. A calculated risk. Khrushchev's threat to use submarines was known to some in the Politburo, but not to the sailors on board. Khrushchev said that if the Americans were going to act like pirates, he would tell our subs to sink their ships. But we didn't know he had said that. Four Soviet subs are close to the blockade line. But communication between Moscow and them is unreliable. There are no clear orders. The subs don't know they are being hunted. The night of October 25th was nearly a disaster for us. A U.S. destroyer, on orders to seize the submarine, is heading straight for Shumkov. 
If I had waited just a minute and a half or two minutes more before diving, the ship would have cut us in half. U.S. ships corner the vessel, an F-class submarine. Shumkov declares a red alert and dives. A cat and mouse game begins. The ship is armed with 22 torpedoes. Will Shumkov use them? With the Americans, we were like two people fighting a duel. And you know very well that in a duel, the first person who fires is the winner. What the U.S. Navy doesn't know is that Shumkov's and three other subs are armed with nuclear-tipped torpedoes. The world is unknowingly on the brink. This button is too close to being pushed. It's inconceivable to me. And when we learned that, we later learned that the submarine commander was likely to be out of communication with Moscow, and almost certainly was out of communication, and under those circumstances, he had authority to launch if he believed it necessary. He could have started a world nuclear war. We were that close. That's not wise management that avoided nuclear war, that's luck. benevolent turn of destiny that spared the world. Savitsky never lost it. He just made a decision. Sir! It's time to load the special weapon. Sir. Give me your key, Masanikov. Withering temperatures exceeding 120 degrees, no contact with home. A ship virtually out of power. It's time to load the special weapon. And now seemingly under attack. Come on! We will sink all the fleet, but we will not humiliate Russia. Savitsky was an impulsive man. But in his mind, at that moment, he made a correct decision. Give me your key, Masalikov. What are you thinking? Your key, Masalikov. He had no rights because Vasily was in charge. He was the commander of the fleet of all the ships. But Savitsky was the commander of this ship. Commander. The commander is the second in command after God. These are the rules the submarines live by. We don't know that this is an attack. For all we know, they are trying to surface us. The future of the world now rests on Vasily Arkhipov's shoulders. We have orders. To defend ourselves. You may be captain of this ship, but I am commander of this fleet, and you need my permission. No, Vasily Arkhipov. Vasily Arkhipov was our commander of the fleet. He was a submariner and a close friend of mine. He was a family friend. He stood out for being cool-headed. He was in control. He was a real submariner. Two of us have agreed. Do I have your permission? 
You need all three of us. He knew that it was madness to fire a nuclear torpedo. Place the special weapon in the initial position and restore protection. And especially that he lived through that and saw it. He didn't hesitate to say no. God only blessed the man because uh, what would have happened after that? We would have been a nuclear war with Soviet Russia and uh, there would may perhaps not be a world. It's time to make contact with the Americans. We were already prepared to use nuclear weapons. We had all of our strategic aircraft ready to fly to Russia, armed with nuclear weapons. So there was no doubt in my mind that we would have had nuclear exchange with the Russians if their nuclear ballistic missiles worked. Their cover blown, the ordeal for the men of B-59 is finally over. Each takes time to leave the sub and breathe fresh air. We were steaming very close to the submarine. He was on our, the port side, the left side of the ship, in the dark with the night lights on. It was about, I would say it was about midnight when I finally got up there to have a look at him. They weren't seven feet tall and they didn't have, have fangs coming out of their mouth. Now, I personally had never seen a Russian naval officer. As far as I was concerned, he was from central casting dour, squatty-faced, and uh, he, he was, he looked pretty mean, actually. The U.S. Navy makes no attempt to board B-59 as it lies outside Kennedy's quarantine line. Instead, they point her in the direction of home. This never-before-seen footage shot from on board the Coney shows the stricken sub. One of the second-class fire control technician, he was able to shoot some eight millimeter film and to see that film and that, that submarine going off away from our uh, control uh, was somewhat saddening. Um, because he was he was our catch. Only one of the four subs escaped detection, and none of the others came close to firing on the Americans. By the end of October, a peace deal was brokered between Washington and Moscow. At the beginning of November, Russian missiles hidden under tarpaulins were filmed being withdrawn from Cuba. America agreed to remove her missiles from Turkey. The Cuban Missile Crisis was over. But for the submariners arriving home, there was disgrace. What heroism? what duty they fulfilled to go halfway across the world and back and survive. And they were treated really shabbily. In fact, I think one of the Soviet admirals told the commanders, it would have been better if you'd gone down with your ship. Extraordinary. It would have been better had they drowned. You see, this is what they call a welcome. That's why Vasily didn't like talking about it. He felt they hadn't appreciated what they'd gone through. When I asked him about it, he said, that's enough. Arkhipov, the man who saved the world, eventually succumbed to radiation poisoning from the K-19 disaster. He became ill and died of kidney cancer, an affliction that took many others who served on the sub. 
It's taken 40 years for the true danger the world faced to come to light. In 2002, Vadim Orlov told his story at a press conference. Before this, no one had any idea the subs were even armed with atomic weapons, let alone that the actions of a single man prevented one from being launched. In Cuba, in honor of the 40th anniversary of the crisis, people gathered. There was the American Minister of Defense, McNamara. There were representatives from Russia. And they were all talking about that. And they said that the person who prevented a nuclear war was the Russian submariner, Vasily Arkhipov. I was proud, and I am proud of my husband. Always.